Brian Abram is celebrating a 10-year anniversary of an accident that almost killed him. Now, that accident left Brian a new grandfather as a paraplegic. And as a grandfather, he has learned to use humor and positivity in being able to bridge an understanding between his grandson and other young people about the life of somebody that lives in a wheelchair or anyone else with a disability. You are going to love this conversation and you're going to love the mischief that we learn about that Brian gets into. Brian's a great children's author and is doing wonderful work by donating profits of his children's books to charities that help other people in wheelchairs with their day-to-day lives. You're going to love this conversation and do me a favor, be sure to share it with a friend after you've listened to Brian and I talk about Granddad Wheels. Hello and welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. This is your host Greg Payne coming at you from Studio 12. This podcast is about being the best possible grandpa you can be. Focusing on what it is to be a grandpa and how we can all share that experience together for our grandchildren. Before we get started, a couple of things I just want to talk about. And that is that the Cool Grandpa Podcast is now on YouTube. Yes, I've uploaded all of these interviews up onto YouTube so that people can learn about the important role of grandfathers. If you listen to your podcast on YouTube, you're sure to enjoy being able to also listen to the Cool Grandpa podcast. Now, I'm only uploading the audio, but I wanted to let you know if that's how you're consuming podcasts, you can find us by just searching out the Cool Grandpa Podcast over at YouTube. The other thing I want to talk to you about is Grandparents Week, coming up starting September 10th. This is a great week where Grandparents Academy is sharing expert advice on 20 different topics. There's sure to be something that interests you, so I encourage you to go and check out grandparentsacademy.com, sign up for Grandparents Week. Now, there's a free version, which gives you tons of information in all of these interviews, including mine, on how to turbocharge your relationship with your grandchildren. And there's also a paid part of Grandparents Week, which gives you even more resources, more interviews, more access to these experts that are really dedicated to helping grandparents and parents develop meaningful relationships so that we can all support our grandchildren and our children. So without further ado, let's jump into this conversation. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I'm excited to have you on, and this is going to be a fantastic conversation. Hi, Greg. Nice to speak to you again from all the way over the Atlantic. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, we both had some holidays that recently been on. We had our 4th of July over here where we uh, celebrated uh, an amicable, well, not so amicable split, but I think uh, we're yeah. we're good cousins now, so to speak. With uh, And then you just got back from Norway, so that's fantastic. That's right. And your president is over here right now talking to our prime minister, I think. Oh, my. I, I hope they don't get into too much trouble. You know, the trouble they're going to get into is that vehicle, the Beast, they had to drive it into quaint little Downing Street, where it, I think it will only just fit. So turning it around to get it out again might be a bit of a job. Yes. And and for those that don't know, the Beast is the big armored limousine that the president uses. And uh, I don't know. You know, I, I think sometimes when he goes overseas, no matter who it is, I almost think the people would rather prefer one of our big monster trucks with an American flag <laughs> draping off the back. It's not, the, uh... it's not too dissimilar, though. It's about <laughs> the same size, isn't it? Yes, I, I think it is, especially from a weight perspective with all the armor yeah. and all the special things on there. I mean, you, you guys will maybe say it's essential, but from a British point of view, it seems a little bit over the top, but still. 
Well, I think that's one of the things that we've uh, become known for is doing things a little over the top. Yeah. But uh, so well, I'll stay out of the politics side of things. That's not my not my bag that one. Oh yeah, but it, it's still fun sometimes when you have these big visits and and things that pop up. It's uh, it it takes up the news and the chat for a few days at least. It does, yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you a question that I ask all the grandfathers, and that is to take us back to the time where you first learned that you were going to become a grandfather. What was going on in your life? What was that experience? How did you react to the news that you were going to become a granddad for the first time? Well, this is this is like um, one of those events that you always remember where you were and what you were doing. So we were in a restaurant. My daughter sprung it on us. It was a complete surprise. Um, but it was just incredible because I'm a, I'm a very young granddad. I don't know whether that's normal, but I was only 55 when uh, Charles, my grandson, was born. So in some ways, I thought, I'm not old enough to do this job. I'm only just qualified as a parent, never mind a grandparent. But it was a, it was fantastic. And the good thing was, at the time, our, my life and my wife's life was such that we were going to have a lot of time to spend with the grandson because I was working for myself, doing some consultancy and um, I was able to pick and choose when I worked. So we, you know, every grandparent gets asked to do the babysitting and you get put upon with everything that the parents need to give them some time. But we thought, great, we can do all of that because I don't have to work if I don't want to work. So I was really in a very, very, very fortunate position. So everything was good at the time. It was brilliant. That was in 2013. Oh, wow. He's okay. 10 now. He's 10 now. He's 10 years old now. Yeah, okay. 10 and a half now and acting like a 15-year-old. <laughs> Don't they all? They they do. I think, uh, yeah, I've got a <laughs> five-year-old uh, grandson. And oh, so right. he's still in that young boy phase he hasn't begun to realize that he's smarter than his parents and his grandparents yet oh he will yeah i mean that i think between three and six is the cutest age because they're funny they're innocent they're curious you can do all sorts of uh, fun things with them but when they get i guess 10 it's starting to be on the cusp of getting a little bit too old for some silly things you know he's just about to leave we call it primary school over here to go to secondary school um and he's maybe too cool for small school now right uh, he's getting sophisticated in fact i had an argument with him only an hour ago i said hey charles i've seen a report on the news that this prime drink that everybody goes on about it's being investigated because there's so much caffeine in it and quick as a flash he said well grand i know you're wrong there because i think you'll find the u.s version has got more caffeine than the uk version so you're actually and he totally shot my argument to pieces. So I've just learned now I can't win any argument with a 10-year-old. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I know. But he's great with technology. I mean, the, the problem we had earlier with the sound, he, he'd have fixed that in two minutes. Well, and it's funny because I think you and I are very similar age range where I think our grandparents, when the uh, VHS tapes and those recorders were out, right, the joke used to be, where's my grandson so they can fix the yep. clock so it stops blinking. We're at that age now where with it, whether it's our electronic devices or whatever it is, it's where's that grandson so that this thing will work right. But it's times 10 because there's so much more technology now and, and everything we have to do, every every bill we pay, every connection we make, it's all online, isn't it? So you, if you're not absolutely literate with computers, then you need your grandson to sort it out for you. Yes. Abs absolutely. And I, granddaughter. I'm sure granddaughters are just, just the same. They are. And what's amazing, too, is that there's a number of organizations, some of which I've communicated with, that are focused on helping baby boomers and Generation X uh, to become more technologically literate or comfortable for yeah. that point of being able to connect with family and, and grandchildren in particular. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm lucky, I guess, in that you know, in my business, I had to be fairly computer literate anyway. But yeah, I mean, simple things like trying to sort the settings out on my iPhone, I I, I need him. It's much quicker to get him to do it than learn how to do it myself. 
right they they there's something intuitive as they've grown up with the devices in yeah. their hands that they know yeah. the three steps it takes to get to a, a setting for filters on a camera phone correct yeah what i wanted to do too is talk with you about your children's books but then as a lead in to that i want to talk a little bit about the accident that then led you into writing children's books about grandfathers sure. in wheelchairs sure i mean that that's there's a lot of detail here and i'll i'll try not to be too verbose with this bit but yeah um i said a minute ago that everything was wonderful yeah i was 55 year old got a got a grandson on the way um looking forward to spending loads of time everything was great financially we we were doing okay we had a beautiful home in in spain as well as in the uk so life was pretty good however it all changed on the 4th of August 2013, which is only six months after Charles was born. Um, without going into all the gory detail, I was out on a bicycle, not a motorbike, a, a bicycle in the countryside, practicing really for a, a big ride that me and a friend planned to do all the way from where we live in the north of England down to the south of Spain, where we had the house. So... I, th I thought I'd get a bit of tra practice in. And one Sunday morning, I set off on my bicycle the 33 miles to ride home. I only got one mile down the road, sadly, and then I came off the bicycle. And I was unlucky in three ways. Firstly, I went over a small wall. And on the other side of the wall, there was nothing but a vertical drop, about maybe 30, 40 feet. The second piece of bad luck was I hit a tree on the way down. <laughs> And the tree broke my spine uh, in a number of places, ribs, uh, shoulder blades, you name it. And then the third bit of bad luck was I landed face down in a river. Um, it was only a couple of feet deep, a fast-flowing stream, but I was face down and I couldn't move. Um, I then sh tried to shout for help for a while, very feebly, because I was very, very badly injured. Um, and eventually I passed out. So I technically really shouldn't be here. Um, but, and maybe I'll, I'll end on this little story, but I was saved by two people who, who came to my rescue on the day. And it's a lovely story about them that maybe I can finish with. So I'm now a paraplegic. I, I'm a urine hospital, a permanent wheelchair user. Um, I use a manual wheelchair, so I push myself around with that. And of course, the world came crashing down for me and my family, and I'm no longer going to be the granddad that I thought I was. So that was a, that was a huge blow. Um, and I went through a lot of emotions around that. I, I cope with it fairly well because, as I'm often told, I am a fairly positive person. I get that from my beautiful mother, who was just the happiest, most positive person you could ever meet. And I'm sure I've got the, uh, the genes from her. So I was fairly positive, but you can imagine how tough it was to think I'm never going to go doing those granddad things of climbing hills and football and, and everything that goes with it. I'm going to have to do different things. Then something happened when he, when he was really little, he started to give me a name. He called me Grandad Wheels. By the way, you guys use Grandpa, and we tend to use Grandad more often. It's spelled differently as well. It's just got one D in the middle of it, not two. Um, so he called me Grandad Wheels. Um, because I'm on wheels and he's got two granddads. The other one isn't on wheels, so it made it easier when he said granddad wheels. We know who he's talking about. And it just gave me the idea uh, about a character called granddad wheels who might get up to stuff. And then I started to worry, what what's going to happen when he gets to that age when he starts to say things like, you know, granddad, what, why aren't you walking around like everybody else? Why, why are you in a wheelchair? So I thought, what am I going to tell him? So obviously I, I decided to tell him the truth, which was that I was attacked by a giant lion in the jungle on an expedition, <laughs> which you know I just thought might make him smile, and, and it did. Um, and my wife said, that's quite funny. Why don't you make a proper story out of it? And that's what I did, just for fun, just to read to Charles. And then I thought, you know what? What if I could get pictures with this that would turn it into an illustrated story for children? And you know what? What if I could get it published so other kids could have a read of it? So I sent it off to every... I found an illustrator after a long search. 
um, a local lady who, like me, was sort of semi-retired, and she wanted to have a go at drawing the cartoon. She's an incredible portrait artist, but she fancied having a go at that. Um, and we sent it off to publishers all over the place, and they all wrote back saying, thanks very much, but it's not for us. So I thought, to hell with it. I'm a fairly determined character, so I decided to publish it myself with the help of a, a local friend who had his, home, his own printing business. And we turned it into a book, and we thought, what the hell do we do now? I've got boxes of books in my garage, and what do I do with them? So we had a bit of a party and sold a few, and then I was very fortunate in that a school head uh, school principal invited me to come and talk to his kids and read the story. And when people heard that it was quite interesting, other school heads got in touch. And before I know it, I'm selling books through schools. And, and then I was on local TV. Um, and then I got more orders. And before you know it, we're, we're shifting books. Um, and right from day one, me and my illustrator said, you know what, if we sell a few, we'll just give the money to charity. Um, uh, we thought maybe a few hundred pounds, um, and as you'll as you'll know, I'm now up to almost sixty thousand uh, pounds on the back of a total of five books now that we've self published, um, and I've now seen almost well, actually, I've gone over it now twenty five thousand children in in primary schools, um, which I thoroughly love. They obviously like it because I keep getting invited to do more, and it all came from this thing of what will. What will I say to Charles when he asks me why I'm in a wheelchair? I had never thought I could write a story in my life. But, you know, when you you have a life-changing accident or illness, sometimes things take you off in a different direction, and that's what's happened. Um, what? So I'm making a difference financially to the charities. <laughs> the kids are enjoying it. And Charles is the proud uh, person who's who's in a character in, in five stories. You you might not have heard of this. There's, I'm sure you, do, you 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 kids over there must know Roald Dahl stories like the BFG, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And oh all yes, that. yes, yeah. Well, the guy who illustrates those books, Sir Quentin Blake, he got hold of a copy of one of my books and said it was uh, an impressive piece of work. So I thought, well, what do these publishers know? You know, it, it seems that we're doing okay, so it's their loss. And we're just getting on with it. We have a sixth one that might come out next year. So that will be a series of six stories for kids about a granddad in a wheelchair who gets up to silly nonsense with his grandson. I like going through and looking at the books that you've had with some of them being, I think some of them were Charlie taking you to maybe a skateboard park. Oh, yeah. And he, and pushed, he thought I was bored. So he pushed me in for fun and scared me to death. The second one I love because... When I'm in the supermarket complaining about how tired I am, he thinks, ah, oh, I can help. So he gets a fire extinguisher and straps it on the back of my wheelchair, and I go crazy around the store and, and cause all sorts of mayhem. And I deliberately wanted my books to be silly because there are enough books out there that are what I call sugary sweet about kids with disabilities or people with different issues and there's a place for those of course but you know what young kids also just want to have a laugh at a silly granddad doing silly things well and it's important that they know too that a granddad that's in a wheelchair or may have some other equipment to help them get along can still be up to mischief and can still be a joker and can still do these different things you know what I said earlier that I needed to find different things to do with the grandson because, like I say, I'm not going to go hiking up mountains and things like that. So if I can make him laugh, then he's going to want to spend time with me, and that's that's my role in life. I'm the person who teaches him to do things that he, his parents probably would dis disapprove of. Isn't that every granddad's role? I think it is. I, I think <laughs> I think so. Is that you? you we walk a line between. Um, troublemaking and a little bit of responsibility yeah, you know absolutely and oh yeah i teach him some some important good stuff i think or i try to although because i'm so silly with him he now never knows whether i'm telling the truth or not you know he thinks i make everything up so yeah but yeah my my job is to make him laugh and and yeah and have fun with him so that's what the books are designed to do and and again, like you say, Greg, for, for, for children who don't have any disabilities, just for the, the everyday kid in a school, it's showing them that 
I'm in front of them. I'm I'm some old guy in a wheelchair, but you know what? I can actually have a laugh and I'm fun to be with. Oh, so they don't look at me strangely. They just take me as the person that I am. Right. It's the recognition of like, oh, okay. Well, you know, this granddad's in a wheelchair. That's different. But granddad also likes to tell jokes where grandma would would yell at you, or oh, yeah, would yeah. you know would would play some practical jokes with you. It's that recognition of like, okay, this is different, but, you know, this is still a person we joke with, a, a, a granddad that might put a dare to us that maybe, you know, yeah. mom and grandma might not be uh, so happy about. They may not approve of everything I do. That's that's fair comment, Greg. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> well, always getting into, I'm always getting into trouble, but there you go. But that's part of our job, too, is to yeah, uh, is. To, to show them that. And I love it because... I've got a person that I, I'm well acquainted with, and he's a veteran that lost a, a leg back even in, in Vietnam. So his his artificial leg, he has uh, like hot rod flames oh, yeah. painted on that artificial leg. And, uh, he, you know, he's always commenting about how, you know, if people aren't careful, they'll have to drop it into fourth and, and watch out. Excellent. One of the, one of the things I do in schools is, um, as part of my session, there I give them a, a, a template. It's a cartoon of of me, but just sitting in midair, so there's no wheelchair. And I get them to design a wheelchair around me and draw it on the paper. But I absolutely encourage them to draw a crazy wheelchair. So I want one that's jet powered, that's got maybe tank tracks on it. Maybe it's got uh, weapons on it to to get people out of the way. You know, I just have a real a real silly bit of fun with that. And some of the designs they come up with are just incredible, absolutely incredible. I saw one the other day where, for some reason, I was being pushed along by a six foot penguin called Kevin. So you know, <laughs> the, 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 they come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. Well, I'm sure Kevin's got a, a brother named Harvey that's a six foot rabbit that's walking around. <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah. <clears throat> so it's just it's all about all about having fun. Oh sure, sure. Now one of the things uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about is just how you are able to start to get Charlie very familiar with the wheelchair. Certainly, at six months, by the time you eventually made it out of hospital, uh, you. We're still needing some care at home, and he was, st- yeah. you know, he's a little kid. He's starting to see these things, so it's not necessarily alien for him, but I, at the I, same time, yeah. it's a little different for him. I think, I think it's because he was only six months old when it happened, and the first experience he had was when he was about one year old. I was still in hospital, and, and he almost learned to walk by pushing my wheelchair around. And thank goodness I've got a little video of that because I used that in my presentation and it's funny because he's pushing me along and then his mum comes and grabs him because he's just about to push me into a window (laughs) and I can make I instantly make the kids laugh with that and say you know this is why we have silly adventures so he's never known anything different has he so it's kind of just normal to him I didn't even need you know I said I wrote the story because I was worried about what he might say um what what he might um, ask me, you know, why don't you walk around? Why are you different? It actually did happen a little while later. He he said, he said, Granddad, why are you in a wheelchair anyway? So I gave him a detailed explanation of of how the spinal cord works and and how it became damaged um, and the impact, etc. And he just looked at me and said, Oh, what's for dinner? Just d- disinterested. He, he just, I am who, I'm just his granddad. You know, he, he doesn't care about the chair. And when I'm in schools, I find that the kids don't even see the chair. Um, they just see me as a person. So it normalizes it because they don't interact with people in wheelchairs every day. So it's an opportunity for them to ask me. They ask me every question you can imagine, including the number one question How do you go to the toilet? I get that every time. But I always tell them. Not obviously in too much detail, but sure. I give them enough to understand the, the process involved. So I'm demystifying the whole thing for a lot of kids, I hope. Well, sure. And that leads to a, a great question, I think, is how 
What's the difference that you find between when children see you in the wheelchair and whether and adults that are maybe meeting you for the first time? And because I find that sometimes yeah. adults we might be overly, let's say, overly sensitive, overly worried about how things are going to be said, reactions. Do you, do you find that? that there are two situations that you find with adults one is exactly that where they're very reserved and they don't really like to 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 ask questions whereas of course kids are absolutely curious it's an innocent curiosity there's no loaded questions they just genuinely want to know how do you go to the toilet you know um parents or adults can be a little bit more cautious but there's the other side with with parents where they can be quite dumb sometimes um in social situations you know what it's like in an elevator six people in an elevator will not talk to each other they won't make eye contact they'll just look at the floor yeah does that make sense till the door opens if i'm in a lift uh, in an elevator somebody will say something and usually they say the first thing that comes into their head they haven't thought about it they don't mean anything by it but they'll say something like Hey, have you got a license for that thing? Oh, I've heard that two million times. You know, and and the most silly things. Somebody the other day in a lift on a cruise ship, in an elevator on a cruise ship, actually looked at me and said, "Oh, it must be great to be able to sit down all day." And you think, <laughs> what? <laughs> Just think about what you're saying there. You'd rather be in a wheelchair than what you know. So people say awkward silly things because their brain isn't in gear but that's yeah you know, that just happens occasionally and i laugh it off i never get offended by that because i realize it's people just speaking without thinking um but yeah grown-ups adults do tend to be a little bit a little bit more cautious with what they ask and they say because they think they might say the wrong thing kids don't care Kids right. will just say what they want, and it's it, you know that it's coming from a place of innocent curiosity. So it's great. Yeah, I hate it when parents discourage children from asking questions. You know, a, a, a little child might see me and want to run over and ask me something, and the parent will s- stop them. Don't bother the man. Don't bother. No, send them over and let them ask me. Because if I tell them, it'll just make it all normal. Sure. Well, and you got a great point there too. And something for us all to remember is that the kids are learning this world. They're learning the environment. There, there yeah. really isn't any anything behind it. There is no ulterior motives. They're not trying to ask you a question and then go, "Oh, by the way, I know a, a yeah. wheelchair salesman. Here's their car." You know, there's none of that <laughs> stuff going on. Absolutely right. It's absolute innocent curiosity and. The more they ask, the better. I mean, I, I get usually, how do I get into bed? How do I go to the toilet? How do I drive? How do I manage to get around? What's the what's the hardest thing to do, like reaching things? And uh, so it's all that innocent, practical stuff that they ask about. Okay. Just occasionally you get a fail, you get a little bit of a deeper question. Though. I think we, the, the first part of education over here goes up to about about age 11 before they move on to the bigger school. So I talk to those kids. I don't go in the big schools. Um, and I've had one or two say, you know, did you ever feel like giving up? Things like that. And usually those questions come from a child that's gone through some kind of difficulty. So I actually get a little bit serious at that point with kids. If I ever get that question um, and say, well, you know, if something happens to you that, you really, really can't do anything about. And it might be you have an accident, you might be poorly. Maybe mum and dad aren't together anymore. And I always say that deliberately because you know that's such a common thing. Then if you can't change it, the only choices you have are to let it get you down and spoil things. Or you have to say, you know what, I hate that, but I can't change it. So I really have to make the best of the situation that I'm in. So I think by answering the question that way, hopefully if that kid has asked the question because they've had some kind of issue, then maybe maybe that answer sort of helps them a little bit. Oh, sure. That, so that's probably the only time I get serious when I'm doing these things. That makes sense. And so it sounds like the, the advice that you would have for parents and grandparents that if we're out having an ice cream and we see somebody in a wheelchair yeah. and the toddler wants to 
go ask your questions, let them go ask a question. Do, what? Are, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and as for the grown-ups themselves, yes. um, I guarantee if, the, if you send the kitty over and say, go ask the man what, what you want to know, I guarantee very, very few people will have an issue with that, will actually love it. If it's a grown-up, I think, I think all I would say is don't jump straight in with, hey, what happened to you then? You know, because maybe we don't want to tell you everything what happened to it. I, I have a range of answers for that question, like um, I forgot the safe word. That's a good one. They don't ask you too many questions after that. Or, you know, I, something about a parachute. I just make up something to make them go away with it. Uh, but maybe a way to do it is to say, you know, I really hope you don't mind me asking this, but is is that wheelchair really expensive? You know, that that kind of thing. I can't see anybody being offended or, or annoyed by that approach. Oh, sure. But just don't just leap in with, oh, you know, what happened to you then? You know, oh, I know somebody in a wheelchair. Do you know them? Right. Because <laughs> they think we're all in the same WhatsApp group. Sure. Um, and, yeah, you know, I know a guy in a wheelchair. He's He's got ginger head. Do you know him? He lives, you know. No, of course I don't. Right. So it's it's the silly questions that grown-ups ask that, that get a bit annoying. Oh, okay. And hopefully that's a great reminder for us to to uh, well, I think it would be addressing anybody, right? It it's we wouldn't come yeah, right up to somebody. It, it, I mean if um we're definitely dating us now, but if you saw somebody with a fine briefcase, you know, yeah. and you'd be, "Oh, what style briefcase is that?" and then that would lead into something else. So, yeah, you, you yeah. know. And obviously, you know, I'm in a wheelchair, but there are blind people, there are deaf people, there's all sorts of people out there. Um, it's a mixed up world, isn't it? So we should all talk to each other and, and understand each other's world, each other's perspective. But there's ways and means of doing it without being so brash as to just come out and say, oh, you're blind. You know, how did that happen? You wouldn't do that, would you? No. So. no. The... Uh question i've got for you too is as you talked about charlie moving over into secondary school is do you yeah. think some of your books and some of your stories will follow along with his no, w- with no. his age you'll keep no no no. You, you must have you must have cartoons over there where the cartoons age never changes well actually bart simpson how old right. is he now for goodness sake oh he's <laughs> he's 35 and on two mortgages and uh yeah you know so no the beauty of my characters is that Charlie in the books is six years old and, and he will always be six years old, even if I wrote another one in 10 years' time. But I don't aim my books at the older children because they are silly. They are quite childishly silly. Um, and that's my market. So that's that's where I'm going to focus them. Okay. If I write something more serious, it will be for a different audience altogether. I started to write the whole story of what happened to me. I kind of gave up on it because I've not got enough time to do it. I might revisit that at some stage, you know, from start to finish, almost like an autobiography, which is pre-accident and post-accident. Sure. But that that's that's just something I might do in due course just to keep me happy. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe you were going to evolve uh, Granddad Wills into a retired spy that uh, Charlie and Granddad <laughs> get yeah, into you know a little what? bit more mischief. We, we've got a quite a famous <clears throat> um, author over here. Well, he's a, he's a TV personality called david walliams i don't know whether you know his work you probably do um and he's written a few silly stories about a grandma that's a bit of a gangster um and a a grandpa with alzheimer's who escapes from a home and goes off on an adventure he's kind of cornered that bit so i'll stick to stick to okay well that that works one of the items too that i want to talk about and we've we've touched on it a little bit is the charity work that you're involved yeah. in with the books and, and how that works. Well, I I'm fortunate in the, the way any business like mine would work is you, you have your costs, which involve the main one of course is printing the physical copies of the book. Uh, then you sell them, you make a bit of a profit and you decide what to do with it. We always thought if we did make a profit, it would be a few, uh, a really modest amounts. So we thought, well, let's just, give it to charity and i chose i chose two charities that really really helped me when i was um, first injured one's uk char- charity called the spinal injuries association and another uk based one called backup uh, and they do lots of practical stuff for people in uh, 
in wheelchairs, training courses, etc. So I thought we'll give a little bit to them. But then, of course, it, it got a bit bigger and we made more money. We thought, well, why do we change it? We're not doing this to make a living. So we just kept going. As I say, in I think probably in, in the next week, I'll be topping it up so that we reach £60,000, which is, is great. I never thought we'd do that. So that's the reason we do it. And those two charities are very relevant to to people with a spinal injury like me. That's a great, great group to be sponsoring and, and helping out. I noticed, too, on uh, the list of some of your characters, you had a young woman that I believe is working with paraplegic uh, Olympics. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, sorry, just before I do, I sure. should have mentioned, sorry, I was very lucky to get some financial sponsorship. So the cost of printing my books now is covered by a sponsor. So that means that 100% of the price that somebody pays, the whole thing goes to charity. So that's not your usual business model, is it? I don't actually have those production costs. So that's helped me give more money. Yeah, there's a lady called Hannah Cockroft, um, OBE. She's got an award now. Um, she is quite simply the best um, wheelchair racer in the world. Uh, she's the fastest uh, at 100 meters, 200 meters, I think possibly 400 meters as well. She's got seven Paralympic gold medals. Um, she's got spina bifida. Uh, so she can walk a little bit, but she uses a wheelchair most of the time. And she is from the town where I live now. So I, I contacted her and she very kindly, just without any question, just agreed to be a character in one of the books. We sent her a cartoon based on one of her publicity photographs. And the story there is that um, we're out walking with our dog, a crazy spaniel called Barney. And Charlie chats to her because she's training on the racetrack which, funnily enough, she does just down the road. And Charlie, being a ten-year-old, a six-year-old kid, said, my granddad could beat you easily. <laughs> and he, he, she laughs at him and rolls off. And I, I, I say, what? You said what? She, she's the fastest. What? Why did you say that? Anyway, I go and chat to her and apologize and said, you know, he was just being silly. And she said, oh, it's okay. Let, let's roll around the track and we can chat. As we're rolling around, Charlie remembers that there's nothing a spaniel likes more than to chase a tennis ball, right? That's all they do. So he gets his ball thrower and he throws the tennis ball down the straight. Barney, who I should have said, sorry, Barney is tied to my chair so he doesn't run off. So Barney sets off at breakneck speed, pulling me along. Hannah realizes what's going on and it turns into the the 100 meters race and, and I end up winning. Oh. So... <laughs> we think we think I deserve a gold medal, so she gets me a golden donut on a ribbon from the cafe, and Barney leaps up and eats it. Uh, so again, it's another stupidly silly story, um, which is just just good fun. Oh, so, and she was a good sport, you know. To to let us do that is great. Oh sure, well, and that's funny. That that yeah, regardless whether it's wheelchairs or whatever, that's just a funny. Good it's little a story. silly idea, isn't it? Silly right. idea, <clears throat> but perfect. Um, let's go ahead and mention that sponsor if you want. Oh yeah, uh, well, it's a law firm over here called Irwin Mitchell. They uh, they do quite a lot of work in the personal injury field. Um, so the benefit for them is that they can show an association with somebody who's disabled but who's doing some stuff. You know, so it's a it's a relationship that business relationship that works both ways they just give me a small amount of money each year to to cover the printing costs so i can keep on giving every penny to charity oh that's so fantastic work, works well works well that's great as we start to wrap up brian why don't yeah. we touch on the uh wrap up of the accident and oh, yeah. talking about that because i want to make sure we get to that and then let's also talk about how people can connect with granddad wills and um, okay you know well let's let's cover that first now got to be careful here because it is granddad g-r g-r-a-n-d-a-d granddad wheels if you google that i should come out on there uh, but i do have my own website so it's granddadwheels.com and on there is lots of information you can actually buy the books there i do ship them all over the world so 
and the prices are on there so i can i can do that um and also if you put a note on there i'll write the name of your grandson in or whatever or son or daughter and sign it and send it off um and i'm on twitter which is at grandad wheels with a capital g and a capital w and i'm on facebook which is grandad wheels with a small g and a small w so that's that all covered i don't do instagram i'm not trendy enough to do instagram uh or tiktok i don't even know how they work so there you go um right shall i end with this story then of of this 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 thing that happened yes. recently yes. i i this every time i mention this it kind of almost gives me goosebumps the first thing is all i knew after the event was that a woman shouted that there was somebody in the river and a man came over who was camping nearby and he splashed into the water and he held my head out of the water so i didn't drown okay that's all i knew i didn't know who these people were and and i only found that out a few years later so first coincidence um I, I am a bit silly a lot of the time, to be honest, and I, I do silly things for no reason. So my daughter was wearing a big padded jacket, you know, the sort of thing that you wear in the mountains or whatever, um, fleecy, downy jacket. And she said, Dad, the zip's broken. It's not, you know, I can't wear it anymore. The zip's broken. I used to wear it, obviously, but I grew out of it for some reason. I don't know why. Um, yeah, maybe it shrunk. Um and she said, the zip's broken. So just for fun, because I was just bored, I sent an email to the company that manufactured it. Um, and I said, listen, I'm not happy with this jacket. Um, it's, it's you know, not the quality I expected. When I bought it in 1976, it was an excellent jacket and served me well over the years. And I sent photographs of me as a young young person in it and the, my wife and the, the daughter. Um, and I threatened to approach consumer rights organizations if they didn't put the matter right well obviously they saw the funny side they wrote back saying ha ha very funny if you've got the purchase receipt we'll gladly replace it touche i haven't mm -hmm. got that obviously. but this is the weird thing then the lady who wrote back said i took the trouble of googling your name and a newspaper article came up in our local newspaper because she lived near where i had my accident and she actually said, I remember the commotion on that Sunday morning when you had, when the accident happened. I thought, wow, that's a coincidence. Then she told her father, he told somebody else in the small village, and the lady who shouted that I was in the water got in touch with me. Um, and we ended up on a TV program together. Oh, hang on, that's my dog trying to get in the room. Go away. Um, yes, yeah, so she, uh, we ended up on a TV program together. And the next thing that happened was even more crazy in that I was doing a school visit and I the kids say, you know, why are you in a wheelchair? And I always end on the reason why. So I told them what I've told you about the accident. And one little girl in year two, so she would have been about six years old maybe, she went home and told her dad, this story and bear in mind this school is nowhere near where i live and nowhere near where i have my accident miles away and she told her dad about this man who had the accident and now he's in a wheelchair but luckily somebody came in the water and, and saved his life and astonishingly that man was her dad wow. and that's just the, the odds of that are just ludicrously ludicrously small so it almost felt like you know fate intervened there um, and on the website address I gave you, there's a couple of links to those two. Uh, sorry, we were on TV together then. So there's a couple of links to those TV interviews. So, I mean, that's two ridiculous coincidences, right? Right. So that's almost like it was meant to happen. And I've subsequently met them both, of course, and bought them lots of beer because you would, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> if, so, if somebody saves your life. And also, the, the two of them are also in my latest book, because I thought, let's turn them into cartoons and make them characters in my latest book, because you would, wouldn't you? Oh, fantastic. So that, that's, that's not a bad thing to finish on, is it, really? It's astonishing. No, no, and that's that's a wonderful story all the way around. Is it, Because I think a lot of times when people have these bad traffic accidents and there's multiple people involved, a lot of the questions are, I wonder what happened to the victim. I wonder what what became yeah. of them or, or whatever. And, and being able to 
for everybody to find each yeah. other and connect. Well, there's the thing. Great. Actually, this guy, he went camping back to the same place a year later, and he was told that I died. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so he, you know, you can imagine he might have thought to himself, oh, I wish I could have done more, etc. So when he found out I was alive, <laughs> you can imagine the look on his face when his daughter told him the story. I asked him about this, and he said the blood just drained from his face, and he, he just could not believe it. Wow. Couldn't believe it. Wow. So, yeah, so that's a good ending all round, isn't it? Absolutely. And Brian, as we wrap this up, is there anything about Granddad Wheels or anything about the charities that you want to talk about that maybe I haven't asked you? Everything's on my website. So I think I've I've told your listeners everything about me. And, and you know, maybe we, we haven't spoken just about being a granddad, we, we've widened the conversation. But I think the most important thing for me is granddads, as you know, grandpas, they come in all shapes and sizes. We all do different things. Some are working, some are retired, some are well, some are ill. We're just granddads and everybody's different, but our grandchildren just see us as the best granddad in the world. Oh, that's a, that's a great reminder and great message for us to, to wrap this up on. So, Brian, we will be sure to put the links to the website and Facebook right. and everything in the show notes so it's easy for folks to find if they're out driving around or taking a bicycle uh, yeah, adventure in the afternoon. <laughs> be careful. And, uh, yeah. you know, thank you so much for being on the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I really it's appreciate it. a great it. pleasure. Great pleasure, Greg. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation with Brian. I found it really interesting how he was able to come back and start telling some stories around the use of the wheelchair. I think like any good grandfather, you want to exaggerate some things, you want to embellish some things, you want to have some fun with it, because that's how we connect as grandfathers so often to our grandchildren. And I think it was great and smart of Brian to listen to his wife and start writing some of these stories down to be able to share with Charlie's friends, and as well as being able to have something to document his own stories that he was telling to Charlie. I know that you really enjoyed this conversation, and I would appreciate it if you would share this with a friend who would enjoy listening to Brian's stories, as well as being inspired by what Brian has been able to do. I mean, giving over 60,000 pounds to charities, to help other people that are living in wheelchairs with their day-to-day -day lives is pretty inspiring. So until next time, remember to stay cool. Thank you for listening to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with a friend. That's the best way you can help us to expand our community, as well as get the news out about how valuable grandpas are in the lives of those kids. If you'd like to leave me a comment or shoot me a potential topic for this uh, podcast, please go to www.cool-grandpa.us. Look for the comments tab, fill it up, hit submit, it's as easy as that. Until next time, remember to stay cool.